Cool. So kia ora tato. Welcome to Scriptures to Green's first online talk. We're broadcasting from Auckland, New Zealand. Um, Scriptures Green brings together a year round program of industry events for New Zealand filmmakers, um, screen creators, and we've really missed seeing you during this time. So we're so pleased to be able to bring you this talk. Um, the topic is building a slate you believe in. Um, we have been talking with filmmakers though during this time and although it's been really difficult with production on hold, uh, we know that a lot of you have been able to turn your mind to development. So it's an awesome opportunity to talk to these powerhouse producers from Australia. We've got Tony Years of Tony Years Productions joining us from Melbourne and we have Christina Seaton from Causeway Films joining us from Sydney. Uh, thank you so much for giving, um, giving your time to us today to, to talk. Um, <laughs> we'd like to thank our sponsors, the New Zealand Film Commission and Foundation North. With their continued support, we're able to bring you these talks. And for those of you joining on Zoom, if you could fill out the survey um, at the end, that would be really valuable for us. It means we can report back to our funders and know what you'd like to hear in the future. So I'll pass over to Karen. What now? Yeah, uh, welcome to our moderator, <laughs> New Zealand producer, Karen Williams. Thank you so much. Thanks, Elise. Kia ora na koutou kato tō, ngā mihi nui, ngā mihi mahana. Kia ora hui hui mai tato tēnā koutou kato. No mai haere mai, Tony and Christina, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedules today to join us. We know that you must be super busy. And um, we are both in awe of your work and your generosity and sharing your knowledge with us today. Thank you so much. Uh, hi to Mikey Tefano. Welcome to our viewers around uh, Aotearoa. Uh, also, I think we've got some tuning in today from Aussie in the United States. Um, it's weird not being able to see you, but we know you're out there. And though our borders are still locked down, we're able to reach out across our trans, trans Tasman bubble. Um, virtual bubble to meet here today. So it's a pretty amazing, brave new world, really. So lockdown has given us lots of time to think about our slates uh, and our careers and our businesses. And I know that a lot of you have been out there plotting and planning. So now is a really great time to take stock and particularly to be able to, uh, to find out more from these amazing producers. Um, so Tony and Christina, your work is, is quite different. You have different approaches, different bodies of work, um, you know, and different, different emphasis, some more in television, some more in film, very broad backgrounds. But um, I, I would say for me, having seen some of your work, um, you're, you tend to take on ambitious projects, eclectic projects, and often with quite challenging subject matter. So I wanted to ask you, just to start off with, how would you characterize your body of work? Christina, what would you say was the sort of hallmark or the philosophy of the kind of projects that you take on? Um, look, I think we're um, mainly focused on, you know, um, on the filmmakers. And um, I guess we, we kind of, feel like we want to develop and produce films that have a social relevance, that are entertaining stories, that um, give an international platform to new and original voices. Um, we're sort of very passionate about discovering and fostering exceptional new talent. So we, um, you know, we go, go out of our ways to kind of look for, for those talents. Um, but it's really, you know, more so than say, uh, is it is it challenging or is it is it difficult or dark? It's you know which I think we a lot of our films are, but it's really do we get excited about it and do we feel like this is a story that absolutely has to be told that we want to get behind that we just want to put out into this world? I think that is really the driving you know, the driving factor for us to, to come on board a project regardless of the genre or whether it's a first timer or, you know, it's, it's really that. Tony, how would you, you've, you've got a massive body of work at this point. Is there, is there something about it that you can sort of uh, say as a philosophy or that characterizes your approach? Um, I guess uh, for, for me, 
I would describe my work as um, the view from the other side. <laughs> and uh, uh, like, um, it, it sort of started from early work that I made, which was very personal, which was all around, um, you know, being a Chinese Australian immigrant and being gay. And so, so, the, so that sort of outsider viewpoint was one that I kind of naturally gravitated towards, perhaps because those stories uh, affected me more. And also because I felt that uh, it was important someone actually tell those stories. Uh, and I would sort of say that that personal tendency in telling my own story then followed me throughout my career and choices that I, I, I have made since then. So um, the work that I do still tends to be from an outsider perspective. Like, you know, I'm, I'm particularly interested in uh, groups that aren't represented. Um, and finding ways of making the unfamiliar familiar. Uh, I, I think that's probably the common thing. And apart from that, uh, you know, certain personality traits uh, ref are reflected in my work. Like I'm a total nerd and um, I like, uh, I have a very broad and eclectic taste. So, you know, like it can go from uh, comedy, like Maximum Choppage and the family law and, Bogan Pride um, to um, sort of sci-fi um, like you know supernatural stuff like Glitch or or um, Nowhere Boys you know like uh, to sort of like you know more sort of high concept drama like The Slap or Barracuda you know like it I've got I've got really broad taste but um, it does tend to be a bit nerdy. Um. Would it be fair to say that, um, Tony, your slate has skewed more towards television uh, after starting out in feature film, and Christina's, so far, most of your work has been in, in features or in shorts and features. Um, so I wanted to ask you whether, when approaching a project, are you thinking about the format or the outcomes first, like, I want to make a feature film or I want to make 13 hours of television? Or does the story or the content dictate what that outcome is. Um, Tony, do you want to address that? Uh, generally speaking, um, you know, like I am backed by NBC Universal, so, um, and Matchbox in Australia, so, uh, and they're, they're television companies, so they much prefer it <laughs> that I find TV projects, because, uh, I, I mean, they, feature films are kind of tricky to finance, and they're difficult, but you know, like I, I've got a couple of feature films on my slate. So, um, generally speaking, my approach is around the content first. Um, it has to be a story that kind of speaks to both heart and mind. And once, once I'm sort of invested in that story, then I, then I will um, look to um, you know the, the best format for it. But I do, I do tend to favour TV because it's, it's just a little bit easier. There are, there are, there's more ways to make it happen at the moment. Um, but, you know, every now and then, God damn it, I, there's a film and I have to do it as a film. <laughs> and, you know. Christina, for you, has that been a deliberate choice to be making feature films or is it just as a result of the talent that you've worked with? Oh, I think it's a combination. I think it's... Um, you know, the way that you enter the industry and how you, you know, how you start out. And um, I think it's just that particular passion that I guess we have for features, but it doesn't mean that, you know, we love TV and we would love to do TV. It's just that we haven't so far come across a project that we find so compelling that, you know, that kind of fits in our brand and that we want to get behind. We just, you know, we want to, but, and we're looking, but we haven't found it. So, so we've sort of also been, you know, getting, I guess, more feature projects, but I think I totally agree with Tony. You kind of, you look at the concept and the concept tells you what it is and what it has to be. Um, I think so increasing. Yeah. Sorry, go on. I was going to say, I think increasingly uh, filmmakers and um, 
uh, are becoming more platform agnostic because, you know, and especially after this COVID time, you know, we're not clear on what's going to happen to cinema. Uh, it's actually now we're really talking about duration and whether a story is told as one big hit or is told in in multiples and and you know like even the fact that tv now is uh starting to tolerate shorter series orders and in fact actually prefer series order like it used to be that you would talk 90 minutes versus 13 hours or 22 hours but now you're sort of like you know some things are four episodes you know like uh, some things are five episodes some things are two episodes you know i i think it's those boundaries are starting to blur. I think it's, it is it is more about the story now, I think. Yeah, particularly as we're not being locked into the ad break structure and you've got to do, you know, 22 minutes or 44 minutes. It tends to free things up somewhat. Um, Christina, you talked about the, the talent and being really passionate and excited about working with certain people and their, and their, and their stories. So I wanted to ask about when putting together a slate or choosing projects, that kind of question of balancing people versus projects. For example, Christina, you've done a couple of, of incredible successful features with new talent, um, particularly with um, the Babadook coming on board with Jennifer Kent and most recently with Buoyancy. What do you, how do you assess the, the um, assess a project when you've got a relatively new or untried talent, perhaps someone who's worked in short form, but not longer form. How do you go about um, supporting that person into a longer form? And um, where does that consideration of story versus, versus talent come when choosing a slate? Um, look, I think those two are intrinsically linked. I don't think you can separate them out really. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, I think we're lucky in this country that we can take the risk on talent, you know, it's, it's less about being untested and they usually do have, you know, body, you know, award-winning short film work, you know, under their belt usually. So really it's about how they, you know, talk about the vision, their connection to that they have to the material, you know, their voice. And so it's really about supporting them, um, tell the story that they want to tell and protect that vision. So for us, um, I guess choosing, choosing a talent and a story comes together at the same time. Conversely, you know, if, if the story is great and the director isn't exciting to us, we, we probably wouldn't, you know, come on board. Um, and sometimes it is really a difficult choice. Like you, you have both, you have an, absolutely compelling story and an incredible filmmaker, but um, the story is so niche that it, you know, that it's, it's going to make it there and it needs a certain budget that it's very, very hard to find. So, so it kind of like all those things come together, I guess, in, in, in choosing who to work with, but really it's about, in the end, it's about the story and what the writer, director, wants to say and how they want to say it, um, I think is really deep down at its core, this is what we feel like we're absolutely passionate about and helping to bring that to life along the way. And Tony, you're, you're a writer, producer and a creator, so you're kind of picking yourself, you're backing yourself, <laughs> but um, obviously you have, to get, you have to choose teams that you work with because uh, you can't do it all yourself. So what considerations go into that? Are you backing your mates or are you looking at incredible talent or, you know, how do you, how do you uh, make those decisions about who you work with, who's on your team? I've, I've found over the years increasingly that is the most important uh, question for me uh, in developing a project. It's like who you work with um, and... Uh, I think that you have, I mean, for, for me, the, the writer is the key to everything. Um, and, um, and whether, you know, you know, particularly if I'm writing, but if I'm not writing, uh, like whoever the writer, the key writer is, the showrunner is, uh, that, that, that is the crucial relationship. And over the years, I've developed a number of relationships with 
uh, key writers who I just keep returning to and, you know, say, say uh, you know, if I, if I have an original idea, I will take it to, the, to you know, a certain number of people that I, I work with and they, um, you know, they either respond or don't. Um, and then we move forward or we don't. But uh, I, I mean, many years ago, I, I sort of, uh, my partner, Michael McMahon and I sort of developed this idea that you shouldn't have, you shouldn't work with someone you wouldn't want to have dinner with. And it's been, um, <laughs> and honestly, it's kind of like, it's, I, I, I still stand by that. You know, like if, you were, if you're not prepared to sit down and share a meal with that person, then you should not be working with them because most of it is process. 90% of what we do is process and time and, you know, and sharing common sensibility, but also respect for each other and kind of, you know, being, you know, which doesn't mean always having this, you know, like having yes people around you or having people who agree with you entirely. It just means that you are able to have a conversation where you understand each other. And uh, like if, if, you know, this other, if the writer says something, I know what they mean, you know, and, uh, and that, that kind of common understanding is, is, you know, we take as a given, but it's not always like, you know, and the, for me, the times when things have been most difficult have been when you don't see the same show as the, as your collaborators, well, or same movie. Um, if you're working at odds with each other, it's almost guaranteed to go a cropper. There you go, guys. There's your uh, your rule of thumb. Would you have dinner with them? I, I guess on the other on the other hand, though, there is it a good idea to work with your mates? I mean, sometimes you run into teams where you know I'm working with my friends because they're my friends and I feel loyal to them. Um, are there some considerations there about just being careful about not letting your personal judgment cloud your professional judgment? Absolutely. Absolutely. You have to, you have to, it's, I don't think it's just about friendship. I think it's about respect as well. You know, I, I'm, you, 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 you don't have to be super close to them, you know, but you have to be able to respect the people that you're working with. Christina, do you have dinner with your uh, collaborators? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree. I think there has to be, you know, a common, a common language, and uh, and I totally agree. A respect, and um, I think a trust. You know, over time you build a trust and an understanding, and really, I mean, it's such a, it's like a marriage doing a film. You you have to do all those things. You know, you have to have the hard conversations. You have to. Um, you know, you have to support, you have to confront, you have to have things out. Um, but, you know, in the end, it's all about the common goal. It's about the story, it's protecting the film. And I think you can only do that when at the core you are speaking the same language. So I think if, if you don't have it, it's just brought with, it's going to be brought with misunderstanding from beginning to end. And I think you just make, make a different movie and that can never you know, that can never become something extraordinary, I don't think. Um, I wanted to talk about now the question around audience and marketplace when putting together a slate, um, because it's not just about building a slate that you believe in, you've also got to build a slate that, that your, you know, distributors, networks, streamers, sales agents are going to want to support financially, and that the audience is going to want to watch. And I particularly wanted to ask you, Christina, um, your Nightingale poster is up there behind you. And um, that is an extraordinary film. It, we were lucky enough to have that screen here last year in the New Zealand International Film Festival. I will say it was my number one film at the film festival. But I also know that a lot of people freaked out. Like people walked out, were too scared to see it. It was a very polarizing film um, and a very courageous film, I think. So I wanted to ask you about when assessing that material, I mean, what, do you rock up to the sales agents and go, hey, we're going to make a film about rape and murder and indigenous <laughs> massacre in Tasmania in 1830 and everyone goes, yay. I mean, what are you, how do you balance the, um, the risks of material like that with thinking about an audience in a marketplace? Uh, look, I think every project is different. 
uh, and you have a tailored approach to everything, I think there's not like a blanket answer. I don't think, I mean, with um, Nightingale as an example, I think is a bit of a different story because Jennifer Kent had such a huge profile and everyone was very, very keen to, you know, support her second film. So it was a lot easier than making, you know, financing the Babadook and the first, you know, rejection after rejection of that. So it was much easier to get through the door and get to the top people that are willing to put up, you know, a lot of money. But also it was a beautiful script. I mean, yes, it was harrowing and brutal and all that, but it, you know, in the end, I think we all felt we are making a film that was, um, you know, I guess about humanity and, and, and surviving that and the connection between, you know, two different people. And um, so I think everyone saw that and was excited by the vision. So it was, it was, um, yeah, it's, it's it was a lot easier in some ways to finance that film. I mean, a, a film like Buoyancy, for example, is different again, but, you know, the the audience for that we knew was going to be niche. It's a foreign language film. It's, you know, set with non-actors. It's all set on a fishing trawler. It's confronting, you know, again, confronting subject matter. But we made it for a really small budget and we were able to, you know, and it was an exciting talent behind it, um, you know, in, in Rod Ratchin, who had a short film that, you know, went to Critics Week. And so I think, again, people just got behind the script and the story and the talent, and and it made commercial sense for that budget. So, so you kind of have this, you know, it's talent, it's the story, is the, is the, um, it's kind of like becomes in, again. It's like an intrinsical kind of. It's not a separate question. The market and the audience and the film and how that how you finance it. I think is you just find the partners that are passionate about it as much as you are mm, and willing to take the risks with you to take the risk. I think yeah. So you you mentioned that it was difficult to get the Babadook up um, and. You know, it's a genre film and it's got dark themes, etc. So I'm wondering from the perspective of a slate and particularly people out there who've, who may have projects that, um, you know, they're having a bit of trouble with getting traction. At what point do you just go, okay, this is too hard or the market doesn't want it or it's not good enough? How long do you kind of stick with backing a project um, B b before saying, well, clearly this is not going to fly, or do you just believe that at some point it will? I mean, it's kind of like we we kind of wheel things into, you know, into into becoming reality in some way. So, uh, look, I mean, it's a hard question. We did have, you know, we, we did and we do have some projects on us, like, where we go, okay, look, this is the last portion, and... Um, we're just going to have to let that go at some point. Very often they're projects where I think um, we kind of knew there was something not quite working um, for one reason or another. And I think over time you just become more attuned to, I think, what you know you can get up, what you feel like, um, you know, the kind of market partners are out there who want it, who, you know, you get sort of this... Um, this idea of what, of what will work and won't. But I mean, you know, we push pretty hard and we, and you know, we're really passionate and we try and keep the momentum up on on the project as much as possible. But yeah, it's hard to predict some, some films don't happen and that's really sad. But, um, but so far we've been fortunate that um, a good amount of our projects have reached, you know, yeah, ha have been able to get financed. Yeah, I mean, I think your slate in particular is, a, is a, a great example of how things that may be counterintuitive, projects that you might say, well, that wouldn't fly with, you know, with a Screen Australia or, a, you know, a funder, a finance or a market, you know, with the passion, the team, the commitment, you can get up. So, you know, for those out there that are going, oh, I'm doomed and no one's ever going to finance my project, well you know, look towards Causeway Films track record. Yeah, and I think sometimes, you know, you, you, you do run into rejections 
you know, all the time um, from different angles and you just have to try something else and sometimes you just have to recognize that the script isn't quite ready or that you need a package, that you need to attract cast before you're able to, you know, to really get it to the next level. So it's kind of building the trust and the excitement around it and, and finding ways to, yeah, I, I guess find the ways to make it more, um, like an exciting, I guess, proposition that people want to get behind and, and every project I think is different and you just have to listen to that. Mm -hmm. so, and so Tony, earlier you mentioned that you tend to like the, um, the stories from the other side of the outsider projects and that's something that I think producers often wrestle with or filmmakers wrestle with. You know, I have a personal story that I want to tell from my culture or my perspective but the network or the funder is going, you know, no, we don't see it. So how have you, you, and you've managed to really be able to put a lot of those stories into the mainstream. How have you managed to kind of balance this, you know, I've got a story from an outside that the executives might not have, have you know, might not resonate with them, with, um, you know, with the stories that you want to tell, how do you make those that market those audiences and your ideas meet? I think, ironically, uh, the market has shifted. And, you know, questions like in the early days when I first started, you know, like I was just, I was such an outlier in terms of you know, the work I was making. It was very niche. It was very marginal. It kind of did well at film festivals and won prizes, but it, but no one really ever saw any, anything I did. And, um, and I, what seems to have happened over the last five, you know, maybe 10, but probably around the last five years, it's, there's been a shift in the market itself and questions. I mean, I think it started happening around the streaming services, the early days of the streaming services, when there was a recognition that niche audiences were very loyal and that you could have a glo global aggregate of those niche audiences that became something significant. And, uh, and so, you know, like Amazon was making things like Transparent and uh, Netflix were, were really uh, championing American filmmakers of colour, you know, like the uh, Master of None, you know, like there, there was a whole bunch of work that seemed to sort of move, move the way that the industry was looking. And I think that Australia has followed in its in the wake of all of that. So weirdly enough, um, the my part of the world has become more mainstream. You know, like so the shows that I'm interested in making are, have that they haven't changed so much as uh, that they, they the the market has changed. I mean, I think that what whatever you make. You know whether it's you know like a, a network sort of procedural show, or whether it's you know like a boutique show, you've uh, or whether it's a web series. Um, what you have to bring to it is your level of skill and expertise, and your ability to um, make you know great characters and great stories and great scenes within you know and to be intriguing compelling and original, um, all of those things that, that are the armory of what we do as dramatists um, need to be, you need to use that no matter what form or language you're, you're speaking in, because th it's that armory which allows what you make to be universal. Like if you make something, no matter what the subject, if you make it compellingly dramatic and you, you know, like you use a few, you know, say you use some genre tricks or you use, you know, like you use the skills you have as a dramatist to, to attend to that subject, then you have a chance to speak to a wider audience. You know, um, you, you have a chance to speak to more than the niche audience that say the, is, is the setting of, of the show. I mean, I, these days I kind of think of diverse backgrounds as settings you know, and rather than subjects, or, you know, like most, like say a show that I did called The Family Law, um, the setting was a Chinese family, a Chinese restaurant, but really the subject was about uh, the effects of divorce on, a, on children. And so, so if you can sort of separate those two things out, I think, I think it makes your work, 
And if you can talk to, say, a broadcaster or, you know, like a, a buyer in terms of what the show is about, irrespective of the setting, then you've got a chance of, you know, finding common ground with them. It's interesting that you raise the, you know, the, the issue of the streamers in terms of aggregating audience, because it's for, for many years, it was actually quite difficult to see, for example, you know, you made the slap, but we were in New Zealand and it didn't screen on our TV. So we're running around, how the hell are we going to see the slap? I mean, even, you know, up to probably glitch, you know, it's been hard for us to see the work because it's screened on Aussie television and we didn't have, you know, with Christine and Spectre films, we're able to see those at our festivals. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, I guess we'll have to go there and talk about how, how the rise of the big streaming platforms is changing things in terms of how we, how we see shows. Um, and particularly with the post COVID era, how are you both seeing things start to chance things changing in terms of that global audience? Tony, can we stay? Okay. Here? Okay. I can Doing talk to that a little bit. Um, well, it's certainly, uh, that, I mean, I'm still working out my relationship to the streamers and, um, you know, like I know people, uh, who work in, in them and I've pitched a number of shows to them. And um, uh, I think that, that they are a, a huge new um, buyer that you, you know, um, but they all want particular things. They, they all have their own remit and your show has to fit into their, their remit. And, you know, you also have to remember that you're not, you know, like you're, competing in a, a global market now, you know, so, so, you know, the, um, so it's, it's not easy, it, you know, it's not an easy sell to sell to them, but so, sometimes if you have the, you know, the right show for them at the right time, then, you know, like I'm doing a show at the moment for Netflix, which uh, has, was shut down, but, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, a thriller, you know, uh, uh, over eight episodes and it uses um an idea that i that i sort of worked with worked on in the slap which is to do a rotating series of points of view and and, and applies it to a, a thrill the thriller genre so you know it's a mystery where you learn something new each episode from the point of view of a different character i sort of describe it as the slap meets cluedo and so um that we're talking about. No, no, this is clickbait. This is clickbait. clickbait. Yeah. And um, and and but you know, I I, I sold that to Netflix, but I, I took it to America, and there there was um, uh, there was a bidding war for it because that particular idea just resonated and and felt original, but also familiar. I think I think that um, I I so you know. I, th I think they they are absolutely a new market, but you have to do your research. You have to know what they want, and they're all slightly different. Like Disney is different from HBO Max, is different from Amazon, is different. Uh, Netflix is you know like massive, and you've got to understand the structure of that. I mean, you've got to do your homework, but I, th I think that they are making a huge difference, not just in TV drama, but also in feature film. Like I, I know so many people working in features at the moment who um, are, are making films with the streamers. Which is a great segue to Christina because of course you launched Cargo on Netflix, which was great because it meant we could all see it as opposed to have to, you know, wonder if it was going to come into movie theaters. So I guess for you, Christina, you know, as we are, we're not sure what's happening with movie theaters um, or cinemas. Are we going to have bricks and mortar, you know, film festivals are going online. Will we be able to go to the movie theaters? That traditional uh, distribution route of go to the film festivals, get, you know, sell your territories, go into movie theaters. How are you thinking about that now in terms of your experience with cargo and with the post COVID world? Well, uh, Cargo was a little bit different, so we financed it independently and we shot the film and it was in early stages of post-production where we, um, our sales agent, just presented like a three-minute trailer for promo. 
uh, at AFM at the market to Netflix and they loved it and read the script and then we sold it to them at that point uh, and it became a Netflix original and I think that was you know an incredible positive experience for us um, you know in terms of um, you know very trusting collaborators it was you know a, a wholly positive you know experience it's really tricky. I think, like Tony said, they they their remit changes constantly. I think uh, it's ever evolving. I think what they were looking for three or four years ago and what they were paying, you know, the amount they were paying for a few years ago is changing as well. So you know, they're developing a lot more uh, internally and producing internally. So it is highly competitive. It's not like oh, you've just done the one and then um, you know you're certain. To be able to go back and and do the next one, it's it's literally not it's not that predictable. So I think it's important to yeah do your homework, go to the go to the market, you know, keep your relationships and talk to them regularly. Talk to the acquisition teams regularly to see what they're looking for, and usually they are very open about you know what what they do, you know what they are looking for. So. But then it has to be like, well, does this project fit or doesn't it? And and I think you're not going to make something just to please. <laughs> please, in, you know, you, you can't direct your slate and the projects that you work on by what... Um, it can't be dictated by the audience. I mean, you, I think there has to be a market awareness and an audience awareness, but uh, over time, in terms of your... just your experience and, and your... It becomes in, in, instinctively, you know, part of your selection criteria, or like what kind of project you take on. And I guess, um, yeah, I think uh, I, I think it's, but it is it is an exciting opportunity. So you know, you you can finance. I think we're in a lucky position in Australia that we can finance films independently, and we can package them. Uh, and then take them to the streamers or to, you know, like the bigger kind of, you know, studios or mini majors. And at that point, be able to sell the film. So, you know, you have all these different avenues, I think, at what time you take it to them. So even if they reject it at an early stage, um, which is very tricky, um, I think it's becoming... The, the more developed and the more packaged and the more, you know, cast you have attached and the more secure they can, you know, they can visualize what this film is. It, you know, there's opportunities to kind of like sell the film at that point, you know. Mm. So, and I, th I don't know, it'd be interesting to hear from you, Tony, but at what point do you take, um, you know, a treatment or a Bible, you know, to, to a streamer? I would, I would imagine they'd want it to be fairly advanced, right, and they'd want to read scripts. And so you kind of have to develop, put a lot of time in development to be able to compete. I'm not, I'm not sure. But. Most of the streamers would prefer to ha have a pilot script in a Bible. Like that's usually the rule of thumb about when to go to them. But uh, during COVID, uh, that was loosening up a bit. Uh, so people were looking at just sort of Bibles or pages. Um, you know, uh, things were shaking up a, a, a bit but you, you know because and you know unless you have say a movie star attached to your project i mean, I mean that, that's the other thing that makes everything so competitive these days we you know like there are more and more uh a-list actors who have their own production companies who are also going to the streamers you know like so you know your, your choice is you know a project with um my name <laughs> involved or a project with Nicole Kidman or Hugh Jackman, you know, like, I, I know which one I'd be looking at first. <laughs> and, uh, and that's my name. So, <laughs> so um, you know, I, I, you know, it, it is kind of, um, it is both more competitive at, right now and also mm. kind of exciting as well. Yeah. <laughs> and as you say, Christina, like in Australia, we also are lucky in New Zealand that we do have a film commission. We do, you know, you do have screen odds. You are able to develop a project and get financing here before you have to go to a streamer or a studio or an, you know, a distributor. So we do have an advantage, which I think sometimes producers tend to forget. Like if you were in Los Angeles, you would be straight from a network or a studio. So 
it is a bit of a luxury having that soft money. So producers complain yeah. about the free money. Um, <laughs> so um, I know that there's a bunch of people out there who are thinking, yes, but what about my slate? You know, I want to ask them a specific burning question. So Eloise, are you there? Um, Eloise or Megan, there she is. Hello. Hi there. Do you have some burning questions from our uh, filmmaking, virtual filmmaking Fano out there? I do. Yes. Now we've had a few comments about um, writers wanting to break into the Australian market. And um, so I'll ask this. What is your approach to finding new material, new talent and new concepts? Do you accept unsolicited scripts? And if so, what makes a script stand out to you? You want to take that one, Christina? Sure. Um, so we don't, we don't look, we're always open to reading. Uh, we don't take unsolicited scripts, but um, what we do tend to do is, um, you know, if you get in touch and, and um, we would read maybe a synopsis or, uh, yeah, usually it's like a synopsis and a bit of background and then we would ask for a one pager. That's usually how we, you know, how we approach things. So, so we're open to that. Um, we kind of have this um, kind of internal selection criteria that we kind of go through and that it's like if the, you know, it's, it, it, is the project commercially viable, does it sit comfortably within, does it sit within the Quadway brand, so is it unique, one of a kind, have much of an impact, can it resonate with an international audience? Um, Will it attract, you know, financing and awards, or is it commercially? Is it a commercial proposition, or a crit does it have potential for critical acclaim? Uh, we also obviously think about our timeline. Does it fit within our timeline? Is it, you know, the potential reward versus the effort involved? So it's kind of like all these different kind of criteria that we look at. Can it be financed? Is it, um, you know, a, is it a worthwhile and suitable addition to the slate and the credits we have already, and and most of all, I guess, are we excited about the talent and 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 the story and the script? You mentioned corporate brand, which I think is an interesting question for a lot of indie filmmakers um, who may sort of shy. Okay, so Netflix has a corporate brand, Disney has a corporate brand. Do I personally have? brand. At what stage in the evolution of the company did you sort of start thinking about your slate um, in terms of its branding? Um, probably pretty early on in, the, in kind of after the first couple of films I think we started to think about that partly because we um, you know this that at that point Sam Jennings, who's my producing partner, called when I joined forces, you know, five or six years ago. And we came together and really worked out kind of a business plan and what we wanted to do. And we had some, you know, luckily some support from Screen Australia, like enterprise, you know, support, business support that helped us do that and really sit down and kind of go to these <laughs> weekly kind of, we called them like couple therapy sessions with this, um, you know, business you know, who helped us kind of build the build our um, business plan, and that was really worthwhile just to think about what kind of films we wanted to make and why, and um, you know, and we, I guess Sam and I are very aligned in our taste and, and the kind of stories we wanted to make. So, so it felt like it was it it became part of you know who we are and the kinds of films we wanted to. Do. It doesn't mean that. Um, just to elevate a genre or anything like that. It's really, it's really broad in some ways, but in the end, it's about yeah, getting excited about the talent and is it is it something like it's about the social relevance and 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 a need to tell that story now. So it's really about uh, kind of clarifying your own identity as producers and as a film company, which. Yeah. I think is something that um, our New Zealand producers could think quite hard about, actually. Um, so, Tony, did you want to address that? I think you... Yeah. Yeah. Did you want to address this sort of working across the Tasman and um, whether you, I think might, you just generate all your own ideas or might you be open to a Kiwi come? Well, you might be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's kind of tricky because I'm, I'm such a 
a softy and I've done um, so much script editing that I always see the best in things. And, uh, but fortunately, or, you know, I have a, 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 a working colleague, Andrea Denham, who's like the head of development in my company. And so she just always says, stop saying yes. <laughs> um, I, uh, I mean, I generate a lot of my own ideas, so there's not really much time for anything else. Uh, the, the thing, uh, we can't take unsolicited material just because, you know, we, ju we just don't have, you know, our company is too small, it's tiny. And we just don't have, you know, like the, the times that I've promised to look at something or, or read something, you know, by the time, time I get to it, it's like often months later and, you know, it just leads to disappointment. <laughs> so, so I try not to sort of, you know, disappoint people at the top. Um, but having said that, every, every now and then, you know, I, you know, through some connection, it's usually through some connection, you know, like it's th through my agent saying, you know, you've got to read this or, you know, so, you know some other filmmaker, you know, referring a project to me. The, the thing that quite simply, the, thi the thing that will always hook me every time is if I feel something. And if I, I feel strong, you know, like if, if a work makes me feel something, then I am likely to sort of be passionate about it. Um, I mean, of course, heart, heart and mind go together. So, you know, it's got to, you know, stimulate thoughts and ideas about, you know, has, has to have something to say about the world. But something that simply has something to say about the world generally doesn't um, make me feel passionate. Um, what really gets to me is if I you know, emotionally respond to a work and can see the potential for my emotional response in it. Because I feel like, you know, what we do as, dramata as dramatists is, um, we, you know, as storytellers is we work in an emotional field, you know, whether it's to make people scared or make people happy or to make people sad, you know, um, it's, uh, and if a writer can demonstrate, you know, in a, you know, in a contained, reduced way that they have the skill to do that, then, um, then I'm, I'm generally hooked. Yeah, and I think the other part of that question was about working across the Tasman, which is something I think we all feel like we should be doing more, but tend to struggle a bit with. Um, uh, I've been quite surprised how few actual co-productions have got up across across the Tasman. Um, I, but I wonder, given the new global order and the potential of a trans-Tasman bubble, might there be more opportunities for us to all be working together? And have you been working, you guys, both of you, uh, across the Tasman? And would you be doing more of that or looking to do some of it? Uh, I'm cer certainly open to that. And I... I sort of worked on, I've worked on a couple of shows that are um, in development and, um, you know, and I'm working with um, a New Zealand producer, uh, you know, at the moment. And, you know, so, so there are, I, yeah, for me, it's, it's not so much about the, the border as the, the people, you know, and um, so, so, I, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also, um, you know, I, I, ha I have a friend who I'm talking to about something. So, you know, can't really say it yet, but, uh, but yeah, absolutely open to it. Stay tuned for that. Um, Christina, any, any thoughts about working across the Tasman and New Zealand, particularly given the, you know, probably traveling to absolutely. New York? Absolutely, always, always thought we should be doing more together and we've been looking for projects. Um, you know, we had a project that almost got up that was a co-pro. I think in the end it's about whether it's an organic, the story is an organic, you know, organically gives you that um, co-production. Um, it's got to make sense, it can't be forced, but it's, it's um, we, we literally like in the, in the process of actually um, setting up a co-pro right now. So we're just, we have been talking to a New Zealand producer about a very exciting project that we would love to, uh, we, yeah, it's, yeah, it's hot off the press and we're just signing the option. So 
can't really talk about it, but it's very exciting. And um, yeah, we, we, we definitely have that on the cards to, to collaborate. Awesome. The, that, that's very exciting. Sorry, Tony, go ahead. The other thing is that uh, the, the, particularly in television, uh, the, the industry is always looking for writers. Like, like the, the, what, what tends to happen is that, um, as, you know, because of the, the global bu bubble, and content bubble, um, a, a lot of um, the top writers, both in the UK and in Australia, are working in the States now. And, uh, and so th th there, there is always a shortage for, for original voices. And, you know, it, it's paradoxical because it's really also really hard to get into TV. It's this kind of weird um, situation where th there's both a talent drain and really um, uh, uh, heavy gates, you know. But once someone kind of gets through, they... Um, and can ha have proven themselves able to to um, deliver uh, that that writer just gets booked years in advance, you know. Like it's so there so there is a real um, appetite, and um, you know it, it requires certain kinds of skill sets that you know, like you, it, it requires being able to deliver on time, you know, like to write fast and to be able to collaborate and work in writers' rooms, and to be able to echo um, a voice if if if, you, if you're not the showrunner, but you know, like that. But if you can do all those things and and still bring something original to the table, then um, there there you know there, there are real opportunities. Mm. We are hearing stories about some Kiwi writers working on Aussie tables. You know, yep. it's really good news and very exciting about your potential projects here. We'll be, um, we'll be keeping tuned to find out what those are. Um, Eloise, what other, what other things do our, do our whanau want to know about? Uh, what do you want your slate to look like in three years? Are you aiming to balance different genres and audience ages or stick with a certain type of project? For me, um, yeah, I, I just have a lot of original ideas and they just kind of like they grow like topsy, and uh, uh, I, th I think the it would probably be you know you know if I can do pretty much what I'm doing at the moment, I'd I'd be really happy. I'm I'm kind of targeting more international work. Like I've got some work set in New York, and I've got some work set in the UK, and I've got a piece set in Australia, and there's something set in New Zealand. So you know, like I'm I'm, I'm sort of looking all around the place. Um, uh, so. If I can keep making that work, you know, we're not exactly sure what the industry is going to look like when it starts again, you know. So, uh, you know, or the the lasting of effects of COVID on the industry, you know. Like at the moment, I'm grappling with um, how do we do crowd scenes? How do we do, you know, how do we have more than you know two people in a scene? You know, like how you know there's there's a there's a whole bunch of stuff that we're really trying to, um, you know, work out how to, how to do. And um, so in a way, I, th I think all of us, are, you know, as content generators are going to be affected by that. Like, we're, you know, we've got to answer a whole bunch of pretty tough questions in the next little while. And, and until we can answer those questions, it, it's really hard to sort of see exactly what the slate will be. You know, maybe it'll be monologues. <laughs> yeah, and realistically, it may not be the great time to be shooting in New York or even. Yes. Oh, God, no. <laughs> I guess we'll find out. Christina, where do you see yourself in three years at the company? Well, I mean, I hope we can continue making, you know, it'd be amazing if we could make two to three films a year. If we can, um, you know, we, we do have, you know, the, the some projects on our slate, but also looking to do more co-productions. We have one project in South Africa that we're hoping to shoot, you know, as soon as the lockdown kind of opens up. We have one in Serbia that we actually, you know, we're meant to be shooting right now that we've had to postpone, one in Adelaide. But we, I think the idea is that we kind of work on, keep working on the kinds of films that really inspire us. So it's, in some ways, it's kind of 
doing what we're doing and, and growing slowly and um, it'd be great to have maybe, you know, a slightly bigger team because it's just three of us. But um, look, that's, I think, the idea is to keep working with really interesting talent and to be able to kind of do what we're doing and, and do maybe some bigger projects, but keep going with supporting, you know, diverse talent, um, new talent, new voices, I think. Yeah, and bringing Australian stories to, you know, an international market. Um, so we've got about four more minutes left and I think I'd rather than unless you've got a really burning question Eloise I did want to ask you guys about markets is there something that we just want to talk about um so the so markets um in the olden days last month <laughs> <laughs> we used to go to markets you know we flew across the world and went to berlin or Cannes, you know um which is where a lot of the buying selling and trading got done uh packaging financing what do you see happening with those are we going to do virtual markets are we going to have little markets like will we still be going to south by uh, to um 37 south what what do you think is going to happen there I think in the TV space, it's probably going to go virtual for a while. I, th I think that the, you know, the whole idea of international travel at the moment is pretty uh, spooky. So, um, yeah, I, I suspect for the next little while, it's, it's, it's probably going to be more virtual. I know that, uh, for instance, people are pitching, doing pitches via Zoom to, you know, in the States at the moment and that, you know, like it used to be that you had to do the pitch in LA face to face with the buyer. And um, that, you know, that has absolutely changed. Mm. Which implies that producers out there, filmmakers should be really gearing up to be doing it as we're doing it now online and, you know, gearing everything so that it can be done virtually. I mean, Christina, are you going to be going to a market anytime soon or is it pretty much all in line? Yeah, I think it's going to be, I mean, apparently Toronto's going ahead, I think, and 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 maybe Khan later on. I'm not quite sure what the latest is there, but um, no, I, I think it will it will stay virtual for, for the next little while. But eventually I do think it will come back because people do want to connect on a personal level, I think. In the long run, we do want to go to those markets, and you know, it is different to meet people one one on one and and be able to go to the, you know, see films if you're so lucky at a market to have the time. <laughs> but um, you know, there's something really exciting about everyone being together, and and I think yeah, that connectedness is so really important. It just has to be safe to do so. So I guess we're another year or eighteen months away before. Can happen, I think. Yeah, and just quickly, also festivals. Um, we got the news that the New Zealand International Film Festival will be online this year, which is great because, um, you know, it means we will get to see the films. But I also felt this sort of, you know, real rush of disappointment because there was something really special about going and sitting in a movie theatre and seeing, you know, the Nightingale with people you know, around you reacting. So what do you think about this virtual versus real film festival? I'm conflicted because I do love the, the cinema experience. Um, you know, I think that all of us who want to keep making films, you know, feel some affinity to it. But I also feel like, you know, we're, you know, as a society, as a world, we consume resources so heavily um, that we're, you know, rapidly leading to a kind of global global climate catastrophe in Australia over the last summer is a perfect representation of that. So um, anything we can do to slow that down by traveling less, um, by consuming fewer resources is, is a, you know, a useful thing for the planet. So I'm sort of in two minds, you know, like, you know, depending on what side of the bed I wake up, you know, one day I'll think, oh, damn. And the next day I'll think, oh, you know, maybe it's not such a bad thing. Christina? Oh, look, I think I agree. I think it, I think we, we will all miss those, you know, the Sydney Film Festival. And, I mean, it is yeah. thankfully online.
online and we can watch all these films in 12 days, you know, which, which is great because maybe we'll get to see more of them than, than we would have otherwise. But it is such a, you know, it's again bringing community together and bringing, you know, filmmakers together and, and exchanging ideas and those things just don't happen just by consuming. So I guess I feel the same way. I think it's necessary and needed that we stop traveling so much and, and really thinking about thinking about how we can reduce the impact, you know, the, the destruction of our planet. But um, yeah, it's again, I, I guess I'm the same, I'm conflicted, you know, and we are making movies and we want them to, we want people to see them in the cinema ideally, but again, it's about, it's about people seeing our work and, and in either way, eventually they'll be seeing them on the TV or, you know, so, so, um, yeah, I, I, I hope and I, and I believe film festivals will, will continue to grow, you know, strongly and, and keep going, but yeah. <laughs> so however we see them, and we know we will see them, we're excited about seeing your next work. Tony, we know we've got uh, Stateless and Clickbait coming up. On Stateless Netflix. comes to Netflix in a few weeks. Awesome. And Christina, we're looking forward to seeing your next project, whatever that may be. Do we, do we know what, have you got something due to release or? Not due to release. We've got three films that we, um, we are hoping to shoot in the next kind of, yeah, six to 12 months. Great. It'll be a while away. <laughs> right. And we're super excited to hear what you've got going on with New Zealand. So thank you so much for taking time today. I feel inspired to get out there and figure out ways to make to make things. Even uh, you know, if I have to stand, you know, <laughs> away from my from my collaborators with a mask on. Um, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks to all the the Fano, the audience out there for joining us. I um, hope you're all feeling inspired to go out there and work on your slates. And we look forward to seeing you again in person at some point. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Bye. Bye.